This morning, as I've already told you, we're continuing in John's Gospel. We're going to be looking at, if I have this down correctly, verses 31 through 36 of John chapter 8. Let me go ahead and begin by reading that, um, that text. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now just by way of reminder, Jesus last time was answering the question, what if you do not believe the gospel? What if you don't trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? What if you don't turn from your sins and follow him? Well, he said, if you don't believe, then you will continue to live in the darkness, the moral darkness of this world. You will eventually die in your sin. You will face Jesus as your judge. And you will go down into the eternal darkness where there will be nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we saw before that what he also said would be true if you did trust him. He said you will have the light of life. You will have Jesus as your savior. You will have his guidance as he leads you through this world. When you die, he will welcome you into heaven. On the day of his judgment, he will receive you as his child. And he will provide for you a perfect home in a perfect world of light where you will live with him forever in his love. Quite a contrast. And it all has to do with whether or not we will simply trust the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from our sins, and follow him. Now this morning, Jesus reminds us, as he was reminding these Jews so many years ago, that trusting him, believing in him, is something that is more than just simply believing that he is telling us the truth. I use the word trust because I want to try to get away from that idea that believing simply means believing the facts. We need to trust Jesus Christ as our only hope of heaven. We need to look to him as he, as he gives himself, as he offers himself to us as a savior and receive him. And then, of course, we need to show that we truly have received him through the evidence or through the fruit of repentance, which is turning from our sins, following him and obeying him. Now, many of these Jews we read this morning believed Jesus. They believed what he had to say. But as we read on, we see that they did not savingly trust him. Just as there are many today who say they believe him, uh, they believe what he's saying, they call him Lord and Savior, they join a local church, but they really do not love him. And they're really not actually following him. Now, the fact that we know that this can actually happen, combined with what we know of our own hearts and what's going on in our own lives, can sometimes make us wonder whether or not we're really any different than they are. We, we believe, we're convinced of the facts, it has some influence in our lives, but we're not following Jesus the way we, sh we should. How can we know that we are genuine Christians and that we are not simply deceiving ourselves. Well, Jesus tells us this morning that you can know if his truth has set you free, that is, free from sin. So what I'd like to do is consider two things with regard to how you can know that you're a genuine believer. You can know, Jesus says, if you continue in his words. 
firstly. And secondly, if you have been set free from the only thing that would keep you from continuing in his word, which is your sin. Now, what is the first way you can know that you're a genuine believer? Jesus says you can know if you continue in his word, verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. That's basically, I guess you say, a tautology. A disciple is, is a person who follows Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, if you follow me, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Now I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus is speaking to those Jews who believed him, who believed what he said. I think he's talking to those that he had mentioned, that John mentions in verse 30. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Now we know the Jews were divided. We know there were at least two groups of Jews. There were those Jews who wanted to kill him. And there were those Jews who were entertaining the idea that he might actually be the Messiah. These were not the Jews who wanted to kill him. These were those who thought he was actually telling them the truth. They were inclined to believe him. But of course, Jesus, knowing them better than they knew themselves, Jesus did not lead them to think that believing that what he was saying was true was enough by itself because the Bible tells us it isn't enough. I mean, you can be absolutely convinced that Jesus is all he claimed to be, that he is the Messiah, that he's the Christ, that he's the Son of God, that he's the only Savior, and still be unconverted. It's possible to be a Christian by conviction, but not be a genuine Christian. To be convinced in the mind, but unchanged in heart. Uh, one thing that uh, we've been reminded of many, many times is that the fall did not destroy our minds. We can still think. We can still reason. We can still see the revelation of God in nature. We know God exists. We can read the Word of God. We can understand what it says. We can even be convinced that it's true. It did not destroy our minds, but it did bend our hearts away from God. And so true conversion is more than just merely being convinced that what Jesus says is true. It's having your heart changed by that truth so that you love the law of God and you want to continue to walk in in it. So how can you know whether or not <clears throat> you are a genuine Christian? Well, first of all, you need to know whether or not the truth has changed your heart. It's not something that's just convinced your mind, but it's actually changed your heart. <clears throat> and the way you can know that, Jesus says, is when you, by way of habit, obey that truth. Jesus says, again in verse 31, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Now again, what is the word that Jesus is referring to here? Well, I think he's talking about the gospel. And we know the gospel is more than just simply good news. The gospel also contains everything that the Lord wants us to do. Now again, contrary to what maybe we believe or what others, you know, many Christians believe, the gospel is not something that we are simply to believe. It's not just something to be believed. It's not merely an offer of life to all who will take it. It's actually a command, a command to repent and to believe, to turn away from our sins and to obey God's truth to trust Jesus Christ to get us into heaven. In other words, to repent and believe. And by the way, I, uh, the word believe in itself uh, has obedience implied in it. A saving faith is an obedient faith. There is what's called the obedience of the gospel. There is something we are to obey. John the Baptist says in John chapter 3, verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Uh, 
Obviously, if one has a saving faith, one will have an obedient faith. And also, contrary to popular belief, repentance of faith is not something that you do just one time. It's not a one-time decision. You know, Christianity today is represented as uh, an evangelist perhaps preaching or the pastor preaching, people coming forward, receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, praying the sinner's prayer. They made the decision. And now they're safe. And now they go on and basically live the way they used to live. No, repentance and faith is not a one-time decision. It's not praying the sinner's prayer. It is something that you do every single day. It's something that you do every moment of the day. Because if God's Spirit has done His work in your hearts, it is now your nature to repent and to believe, to repent of every sin as you become aware of it, to confess it to the Lord, to turn away from it, and to trust Jesus Christ at every moment for your salvation. You know, the funny thing is we often think that we've, we've done it when we've trusted Jesus. But it's not just one time. It is life long. That's what the Lord is telling to us. If you continue in my word, if you continue in the gospel, if you continue to repent and to believe, then you are truly disciples of mine. Now Jesus says the second way that you can know that you are a genuine believer it seems to be really the cause of the first. If you have been set free from the only thing that keeps you from repenting and believing and continuing in his word, and that is from your sin. Jesus says in verse 32, I believe it is, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, as I was looking at this, you know, you, you really have to come to grips with this if you're going to preach it because uh, otherwise you can look at it as you're reading along and say, well, you know what, I don't quite understand what this means, so I'm just going to continue to read. But when you're preaching through this, you have to stop and try to figure it out. And I know what Jesus is saying here sounds a little bit confusing because we often look at these things the other way around. We usually see them reversed. You need to know the truth of the gospel first before you can be set free from sin so that you can follow Jesus. But here, Jesus is saying you must first continue in his word before you can know the truth that will set you free from sin. Seems like we have a paradox here. Seems like we have a contradiction. But we, are, we don't actually because the answer to this seeming paradox is actually found in the word that Jesus uses here for no. The word no. There are many words that have this meaning in the Greek language. But the two most common are very different. <clears throat> different ways of knowing. One means to know how to do something. The other one means to come to know that something is true through your experience. Let me give you an example. The first one. You can know all the how-tos about marriage, right? What it is, what it requires, what you're committing yourself to, how it is you are to love your spouse, and so on. You can know everything there is about marriage. But it's quite a bit different when you actually get married. Then you really know what marriage is all about, what is required of you, and how it is you need to lay down your life to love your spouse to fulfill your commitment and your vows to him or to her. Now, the word that Jesus is using here is the latter, that is, to know something by way of experience. He's saying that if you continue in his words, if you truly become his disciples and follow him, press forward in faith and repentance, that you will experience the truth you will know the life-transforming power of the gospel. You'll know more than just the gospel abstractly. You will know its power in your life. You will experience a greater freedom from sin. Basically, you will be set free from it. Now, we all know that when we first trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ that we were set free from sin. You were no longer a slave to sin. 
Its dominion over you was broken at that moment. That's one sense in which the truth makes you free. But you, as well as I, know quite well that we are still far from perfect. Sanctification is something that continues throughout life. Jesus is basically saying, as you continue to follow him in faith and repentance, you will experience full liberty. Not, not perfect liberty, but an expanding liberty. You will overcome your sins one by one. Basically, this is another sense in which his truth will set you free. So if you want to know that you are a true believer, you need to understand that you have to push beyond merely knowing what God's word says, believing what it says to be true. You must actually continue in that word. You must become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must experience that truth in your own life. Basically, you must see yourself overcoming your sins and obeying the Lord. In other words, putting off you know, the flesh and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is going to fine-tune this a little bit as he goes on to, ex well, to express to the Jews or explain to them what was apparently something confused in their minds. They did not understand what Jesus was saying, what he was talking about. They thought he was saying this truth would free them from some foreign enemy. Uh, John writes in verse 33, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now I want you to notice here that they basically were making two assertions, two claims. First of all, we are Abraham's descendants. We're his children. Secondly, we have never been enslaved to anyone. Now, Jesus goes on to challenge both of these claims, but I just wanted to mention this because we're only going to look at his challenging the second claim. We've never been enslaved to anyone. Uh, he's going to challenge the fact that they're Abraham's children in the, the passage as it goes on from here. Now, first of all, he challenges their claim that they have never been enslaved to anyone. This is a really rather strange thing for the Jews to say. Maybe they said it at the heat of the moment, considering that they had been enslaved many, many times. They were enslaved by Egypt for like four, over 400 years, by Assyria, by Babylon. They were actually taken into captivity, by Persia that succeeded Babylon, by Alexander the Great uh, in his Grecian Empire, by the Ptolemies, which was the division of his empire following that, and the Seleucid kings. And that's just to name a few of the people, a few of the foreign powers that had actually enslaved them. Now, they had experienced a short freedom, a short time of freedom under the, the Maccabees, but they were currently enslaved to Rome. They were under the dominion of Rome. So how could they possibly say that? Well, this shows you how irrational man can be how irrational we can be. I mean, just look at your own experience when you get angry at something. Don't you become irrational? Don't you say things that aren't true? Well, I think that's what's happening here. But Jesus goes on now to clarify. He wasn't talking about that kind of slavery, one that's imposed by a foreign power. He was speaking of something that was a bit more domestic, something a little bit closer to home. Jesus answers them in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. You think you aren't slaves, Jesus says, but you are slaves. You're the slaves of sin. It's obvious because that is what you're doing. Now again, let me remind you, he's speaking to those Jews who believed what he was saying. Jesus says, you are the slaves of sin. When sin has the power to command you, then you are its slave. Now again, I realize that statements like this and statements like what we read in, in 1 John can be a little bit unnerving. So before you panic and conclude from this that you're not a Christian because you commit sin, and we all commit sin, you need to understand what Jesus means here. 
Now, he doesn't mean if you commit sin at all that you're a slave to it and can't be a Christian because every believer sins every single day as over against those who believe in perfectionism. The Bible does not teach perfectionism. You and I sin every single day. It's really those believers who think they don't sin that are blind and slaves to sin. I mean, just think about what John writes in 1 John 1.8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if we should be under the delusion like these Jews that we're not enslaved and we don't sin, that means you really aren't saved at all. So what does Jesus actually mean by this? What he means is if you habitually sin, if you practice sin, if you sin without fighting against it, then you are the slave of sin. In other words, if you obey it and you do it willingly, then you are the slave of sin. He means the same thing that John meant when he writes in his first letter, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, which I believe was our meditation. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. I want you to notice the word that's been included here by the translators who practices righteousness, the one who practices sin. You see, John here is using what's called the present tense in the Greek, which really refers to a continuing action, a repeated action. Well, Jesus is doing exactly the same thing. He's not talking about a one-time act or even one that sadly might be repeated several times. He's talking about somebody who repeatedly commits sin but doesn't fight against it. Every believer repeatedly struggles with their sin. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's one particular sin. Every true believer struggles with sin. Every true believer has at least one besetting sin that he or she struggles with all the time. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about someone who practices sin, somebody who doesn't fight against sin because that is what he or she wants to do. Such a person is under the dominion of sin. That person is the slave of sin. Now, I want you to understand what Jesus is saying here. If you should be such a person, if you are a slave to sin, if there's any one sin that you are giving yourself to that you are not fighting against, but you are just practicing willfully because that's what you love and you know the Lord tells you not to do it, Jesus says you are a slave and not a child of his. And so you will not remain in his house. He says in verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. Jesus here is not talking about himself as being the son of God, but he's contrasting what is true of a slave to sin and a child or a son of God. One is going to remain in the house, but the other is not. Now, someone who is enslaved to sin might be in God's house on earth. That is, they might be a part of the visible church at least for a while, if he or she confesses to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus says they will not remain in God's house when they leave this world. The heavenly kingdom that the Lord has provided for his children is reserved only for children, only for those who belong to him by adoption, only for those who trust his son only for those who continue in his word, only for those who have been set free by that truth into the liberty of obedience of righteousness. It is not for those who are slaves. So the last question we need to ask is basically this. If you are a slave to sin, 
How can you be freed from it? Well, there's really only one way, and that's the way that Jesus has been telling you. You need to hear the gospel. You need to believe the gospel. You need to do what the gospel calls you to do. You need to repent to turn from your sins. You need to believe, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and follow Him. You need to continue in His Word and you need actually to experience the truth of God in being set free from your sins in your actual experience. Again, not just from the judgment of sin, not just from the guilt of sin on that day of judgment, but from the actual power of sin while you're in this world. You need to understand that freedom begins and ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to come to Him. Uh, Jesus says in verse 36, So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. If you come to Jesus Christ and truly trust in Him, turning from your sins, purposing to follow Him, then He truly has freed you from your sins. You, you've gone beyond just believing the facts. Your heart has actually been converted. Now, this doesn't mean that you're no longer going to struggle with your sins because the struggle really begins after He frees you from sin. I know that sounds kind of strange and contradictory, but it isn't because when you were the slave of sin, there was no struggle. You simply practiced it. You simply gave yourself to it. You did what was in your heart to do. There was no struggle. You you simply practiced it. But once the Lord freed you, you no longer wanted to submit to it. And that's when the war began. But I'll remind you, it is a war the Lord has won. And one that He will give you the power to win if you continue in His Word. You must continue in His Word. Otherwise, you will not know the truth. The truth will not set you free. You will not experience it but if you do continue in his word that's exactly what you will experience it will show you have the spirit of God in your heart your nature has been changed because you want to go in this direction and so ask yourself this morning what is your condition what are you doing are you continuing in his word have you repented of your sins have you trusted him has he set you free from sin so that you are no longer practicing sin? You're no longer the slave of sin. Has the struggle against sin begun in your life? If it has, then you are his disciples. Or have you not trusted him? Are you not continuing in his words? Are there sins that you allow and you do not fight against? Sins that you are not willing to give up? If that is true, then you are a slave to sin. And if that is true of you, there's only one thing that you can do. Come to Jesus. He is the only one that God has provided who can free you. Do not stay the slave of sin. Remember, slaves will not remain in God's house forever. Only sons will. Slaves will be cast into the outer darkness. They'll be cast into hell where there is nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you would move from being a slave to a son, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You must look to him to free you and to move you into his house by adoption. If you're the slave of sin, look to Christ. Look to him for his spirit to set you free. And if you look to him in genuine faith, he will free you. And he who the Son makes free is free indeed. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to show us what we need and to help us to do what we need to do in response to that.